Welcome everyone to Coaching in Session. My name is Michael Reardon and I'll be your mindset coach today. And today we're going to be talking about teaching, coaching, and how to be an effective parent. Because who doesn't want to be that nowadays? Of course, if you're new to the channel, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and to share this video and or audio. Because today we have a special guest, Cameron Johnson. A little bit about Cameron Johnson is he's a 10-year veteran athletics director that looks to build students' sense of self and foster strong communication between parents and their children. His experience include threes, fours, kindergarten, second grade, and physical education. He has a master's degree from Sarah Lawrence College. He develops his love for block building, and he works with other teachers to incorporate block building into their classroom programming. He spent eight years coaching basketball at a Division II level, helping young men develop life skills for their future endeavors. During his tenure as a New York City public school teacher, he developed a basketball program that grew from 12 to 90 students. And this time he changed the mindset and the culture revolving around sports and student athletics. He believes in the strength of the village and feels you should too. We motivate our kids through shared stories and experiences similar to the Native Americans and other cultures of old. Our experiences are lights that guide the path of our next generation. We cannot be afraid to shine lanterns because of our own insecurities. To guide their path, it takes all of us. Any and everything you do, do it with passion, do it with grit, find your passion and get to it. So let's get to that interview with Cameron Johnson. Welcome, Cameron Johnson, the coach in the session. How are you doing today? I am doing well. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for allowing me in your space. I really appreciate your time. Of course, of course. So read your bio. All your information is in the description box below. But in your own words, can you tell the audience who you are, what you do? Ah, sure. I am a 10-year veteran uh, teacher. I get to say veteran because I made that 10-year mark. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm currently a uh, physical education teacher and athletic director in New York City. Uh, for a uh, middle school. I've taught kindergarten. I've taught second grade. I've done some block building uh, professional development for children, how to integrate that into the classroom. I've actually, I've run an athletic program. I started an athletic program at my school, mm -hmm. uh, started with 12 kids about seven years ago, finished up with 90 kids before the pandemic hit, lost my funding, unfortunately. And I'm also a villager. I consider myself a villager. I believe that we are all villagers. We are all responsible in some, um, some way of raising our children. So I believe in the power of the village. Perfect. Yeah. And we're going to get into the concept of the villager a little bit later, yeah. but I wanted to get into teaching first, right? The aspect of teaching, the importance of teaching, because many people think that teachers are just glorified babysitters. And if anything, the pandemic has showed that teachers are so valuable. And I know here where I'm living, they're actually increasing the salary of teachers because they understand that teachers are so valuable and that they're underpaid and underappreciated. So can we, I get a little bit of your experience, whether you start from kindergarten, first grade, second grade, or currently in middle school? Absolutely. So, well, thank you. Shout out to your city for recognizing the value of teaching. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I believe a lot of parents during the pandemic realized that what we do is so precious and valuable. Uh, parents find and realize that we spend eight hours with your child every day, you know? So we're not just, you know, babysitting. We're, we're teaching them life skills. We're teaching them how to communicate with their peers. Uh, we're teaching them how to uh, work within a group, even though they may not necessarily want to. Uh, we're dealing with their social development. We're dealing with their physical development. I can't tell you that um, how difficult it is now that since the pandemic, you know, we're we're catching up a lot of children, not necessarily just academically, but socially, where mm -hmm. we're we're forced to realize that kids have not been to school for two years. So they're missing that social aspect, that being one of 27 inside of a classroom um, and the children are coming back into school upset because they're not getting your attention. And us as teachers recognize and realize that because it's like, oh, it's not that you are upset about the attention. It's the fact that you're now realizing that you can't just go to mom or dad or aunt and uncle and it's one-on-one. -on -one. Now you have to wait your turn. That's the skill you have to learn, right? Mm -hmm. Waiting your turn. 
being clear and articulating your point because at home you could say something and your parent understands, but I may not know you. So learning that communication, learning about yourselves and in middle school, dealing with the hormones, right? Oh, yes. Ooh, there's the new, <laughs> you know, dealing with the hormones of it all. Ooh, why do I, why when that boy or girl walk by, I feel a certain way. And the emotional aspect of being away from home on top of that, the physical aspect, right? Being comfortable in your body. You grew four inches and nobody saw or recognized, right? So now you're learning how to move again in certain spaces mm-hmm. and you, you have that uh, uncomfortability factor with you. So there's a lot going on and I'm, you know, right now I'm just speaking in the middle school aspect. There's a lot of changes happening all at once and they're trying to navigate and figure out. And it's up to us to help them with that. And it's up to parents to listen when we communicate to them, like, this is what's going on with your child. We're not attacking your child. We're not, we want the best for your child like you do, but you have to take in our information because overall we're trying to help you develop the best human being, you know, uh, possible. But definitely I've seen a lot, like I said, a lot of catching up. Because if you think about it, the sixth grader right now, the last time they were in school was in fourth grade. Right. Right. And you, as well as I know, there's something about being in physical contact and space with a teacher that the computer doesn't allow. The, the eye contact, the walkover of, hey, I'm having a problem with this here, but I don't want to say it out loud. But you can kind of disappear on the computer screen and not be seen and just look it up on Google real quick. But you mm-hmm. didn't really grab the concept. Right. You didn't really develop a true understanding of concept that if you were in person, we can see it. Mm-hmm. We know what's going on and we can address it and then we can help you. So right. I think now uh, in no better time for teachers and parents to come together because we're going to need each other to raise these children. Because if we don't don't do it, social media will trust me. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Wonderful topic. Great points made there. The first thing I want to talk about I'm not sure if you are aware the CDC came out and they lowered the child, the child developmental standards. So Mm. basically from one to three months, the child is supposed to do this, right? So they had standards before, and then they have new standards and they changed it, I believe two or three months now. Mm. And so what they did was they just lowered the standards to meet the standards of our current children. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Oh, wow. Um, I can't, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to answer this. And as I'm answering it, I think I'm going to come up with where I stand on it. Mm -hmm. I can see the value in lowering the standard only uh, because of the, like I said, the social interaction was gone for two years. So normally at, you know, certain kids at certain ages are outside Mm -hmm. uh, interacting and kids are sponges. They're learning through the world. They're learning through interactions. They're learning through experiences. So if you eliminate two years of experiences, You know, there is going to be a lack of whatever, just a lack of like, for example, I know my I have a uh, one year old, two year old and a 13 year old. Normally at the one and two year old, what is the natural instinct? Right. You take your kids outside to the park, you take your child out to the park. They're they're running. Right. They're getting that physical activity. They're getting used to running in shoes. Mm -hmm. Right. And then they run into the kid. They both fall on the floor. What happens? Then the parents interact. Hey. You fell on the floor. Everything's okay. You start that conversation, but they're getting used to the world around them. So then now they're home. They're not moving around as much. They're probably spending a little bit too much time watching PJ Masks and Paw Patrol. Mm -hmm. Um, Right. So they're gaining a little knowledge that way, depending on the shows you watch. But that one on one contact with other people is gone. So Mm -hmm. in that aspect, I do understand that. They're lowering the standards. They're lowering the expectations of it. But the parents see see, what you just told me. I did not know. And now I appreciate you telling me Mm -hmm. because as a now my parent brain comes on and goes, okay, they've lowered the standards, but I should not lower my child's standards. How can I get them where we're making sure we're developing and getting these skills? See, Mm -hmm. there's going to be those parents that are going to lay back and say, okay, well, they lower the standards. It's fine. It's like, okay, they lower the standards, but there's still a higher standard that they need to get to. So how can we get them there? What can I do? So what can you do? You can push yourself. You maybe play tag inside the house. Maybe look at different activities that you can do inside the house to get them creative, get them thinking, get them, help them with the problem solving. So there's not that far gap. There's not that big of a gap when they get back into the classroom and get back into the uh, social spaces. So in a way, I see how it's good, but it's also I, I encourage parents to, 
push the envelope a little bit to make sure we get back to whatever is the norm. This may be the new norm, but let's get back to pushing to the norm. Yeah, definitely. And I agree with that too, because it is good short term, but mm-hmm. for the long term, it's not going to be good, right? Because we want them to get back to where they were. So they're at, you know, they're going to be socializing at one and two. They're going to be running around one and two, going to the parks. Everyone's having a good time. Everyone's learning. Because right. one, because one of the primary areas that children learn from is their environment, environment and, exactly. and then behavior. So they're learning from their environment. And if their environment is their home, that's all they know. Exactly. And so we took away the schools for a year and a half, you know, almost two years. And then now they have to basically say, well, I don't know what it is to be a third grader or a fourth grader. And now they're in fifth grade. Right. So they miss recorder if you if you're in music, you know, third grade. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and third yeah. grade they start recorder. Fourth grade is kind of like beginning as uh, is a junior band and then a little bit of recorder, sometimes depending on the school district. And then you can go into a uh, chorus once you hit fifth grade and and then full, you know, full on band. Right. So they're learning, but they miss a crucial part, you know, of their development. And I'm not sure what the CDC was thinking when they said, let's lower the standards. Was it to help understand, okay, let's get them back to where they need to be? Or is it like where they're here? We want to make sure that they're not viewed as someone who is incapable of something. So they just lower the standards to make them feel better. And it's similar to everyone gets a medal, right? Uh Everyone, Everyone gets a medal. Everyone wins. For me, I'm a firm believer in challenge, where challenge is going to mold you into a better person, right? Because if you don't have challenge, what does that do to you, right? What does that do to your mind? It can create entitlement, it can create selfishness, jealousy, there's so many other negative factors that can come with it. Now, there are some good things, I'm not going to say that everyone getting a trophy is all bad. But some of the primary things that people take from winning a trophy is like, okay, whatever I do is accepted. And, Mm -hmm. and, and that can be dangerous in its own Mm -hmm. right, because if I do something and I win, then, okay, I don't really have to try so hard. And then, Mm -hmm. and then people are not pushing themselves. Mm -hmm. Do you see that your students or that the people you coach are not pushing themselves now more than in the past? Oh boy. You just, you just struck right into my wheelhouse. (laughs) You, You right there. Okay. So now we can really talk. See, now I feel good. Now we can really talk. So I have this old adage that I I tell everybody. You can hide if you cannot write. If you're not a good writer, you can hide it. Mm -hmm. You can hide if you do not read well. You can hide if you're not good at math. You cannot hide if you're not good at a sport. Mm -hmm. Okay? Or you're not good at acting or you're not good at music. I prefer, I talk about sports because that's where I'm at. But you cannot hide. Why? Because that is something that everyone can see. Mm-hmm. They can see if you can't run. They can see if you're not the fastest. They can see if you can't throw the ball. I believe sports is one of the biggest teachers of life. Okay. You're not always going to win. You will always lose, but you're not always going to win. Mm-hmm. I want everybody to listen to that. You, you're always going to lose, but you may not always win. But what do you do in those challenges? Okay. You have to accept that challenge. Mm-hmm. You have to find ways to push yourself. Now, I'm finding, you know, what we're talking about, what I'm finding that. A lot of the kids are having a difficult time when things get hard. They want to stop. They want to quit. They want to complain. Or if they go complain to the right people, you know, oh, well, no, no, this is life. When you get into the real world, when you get a job, you can't go complain to your boss all the time because you will get fired. Right. Mm -hmm. Because they gave you a challenging thing that you need to complete. Like that's that's part of it. So. We have to teach them at an early age to deal with adversity and be accountable for their success as well as be accountable for their failures because they're learning. When you fail, you learn, right? You learn, you grow, you get better. It gets a little bit easier. And we as a society, we shy away from that now because we're worried about feelings. Mm -hmm. I know. And, and I never, and I, and I'm a person that look, I, I'm in my emotions. I feel a lot. But what I say is feel how you feel, but eventually you got to get over it because it's got to get done. Because mm-hmm. the end, at the end of the day, nobody really is going to feel sorry for you. Right. right? They're going to just find another way to attack you. They're going to find another way to come at you, especially if they sense weakness. 
Right. Okay. So feel how you feel. You can show your emotions, but show that you're going to get up and you're going to get moving. You know, in my background, you see passion and grit, right? That's, I'm a firm believer in that, right? You have your passion, you feel how you feel, but the grit is to keep going. Develop those skills. You know, push yourself. Don't find the easy way out. There's nothing, nothing easy about life, okay? There's nothing easy about life. We as parents and teachers have to teach you how to work through those moments. Perfect example, I have an example of that where uh, one of my kids, when they were in fifth grade, uh, we're playing a game and he's getting killed. He's getting elbowed. He's getting hit in the mouth. You know, and he's like, oh, I want to get out of the game. He's, you know, he's crying. And, you know, I pulled him out. I said, OK, go sip of water. Go get a sip of water. OK, but I'm putting you back in the game because either you're going to quit or you're going to work through it mm-hmm. and push yourself. And this is a choice you have to make, but I'm going to allow you to have your moment. So went to the side, cried a little bit, sipped the water, got back in the game, threw a couple of elbows, you know, still was upset. But then the next day kept working. Next day kept working. Mm-hmm. Fast forward, went from a uh, fifth grader who didn't want to do anything to becoming a starter for me in eighth grade. Mm-hmm. And the reason why we won, you know, 10 out of 10 out of 12 games, the reason why we made our first playoff run, you know, because they pushed through that adversity. Mm-hmm. Right. They found success in the hard times and realized that it would not be like that all the time. Fast forward. Now they're playing in high school, finding success. Getting college offers, finding success. So in that moment, I acknowledge you acknowledge their pain and what they're going through, but you let them know like you can get past this. Like this is not the end all be all. So it's important for us to acknowledge and listen, but also encourage them to push past it and have their back, you know. Mm-hmm. So would you say that those are your expectations or the standards that you just follow as a coach? Well, that's my life expectations. My mm-hmm. life expectation is to feel the moment, you know, feel how you feel in that moment. But then we, we still have to figure it out because if you don't figure it out now, the moment will not go away. Mm-hmm. You know, you're going to have to you're going to have to find a way to feed your family. You're going to have to find a way to get that car to get around. You're going to have to find a way to get to work. You know, you're, you're always going to come up across a situation where you have to figure something out, even when it's not convenient. And. That's just like a life lesson. So if you're teaching them that now in fifth grade, fourth grade, younger, you know, in the younger years, eventually it's a skill they develop like, OK, this moment is hard for me, but I know I can push past it. I just have to figure it out a way and know that you don't have to figure it out by yourself. Like you can reach out to other people. There are people around that will help you, that can help you. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's the other part of that as well. but. You know, that, like I said, coaching is, for me, it's, it's about the life skills. I just happen to use coaching to teach the life skills. Of course, of um, course. Yeah. yeah. I used to be a swim coach. And when I would teach them, I would, I would teach children from six months all the way to upper teens. Mm-hmm. And the different age groups, you just have to know how to work with them, of course, because they right. just have different personalities, different terminologies. And what I noticed is that they always look for mom and dad when they're younger. They're like, hey, are you going to save me, you know, for these 30 minutes? Because right. swimming is is challenging, you know, yeah. it's just super tiring. And they have to build that endurance. So as they're building their endurance, they're like, man, this is a lot of work. This is challenging. Throughout my instructor training, I got better at understanding the balance of work and rest mm. because yeah. it was something I had to learn because I was I knew how to swim. I knew how to teach. But do I know how to read a person and say, okay, they're at their limit. Let's pull back. That makes a good coach, I think, because then you can push them as hard as you can without breaking them. You know, for you, great job. When that student, you know, came to you and saying, hey, I don't want to be in the game. You say, go get some water, take a break and then come back. Right. That allowed him to say, okay, just because I took a break, it doesn't mean I'm giving up. Right. Because that giving up. Is, is the part we want to avoid. We want to help them become resilient. And there's things that a coach can do that a parent can't do. And I remember early on, a parent came to me saying, yeah, I know how to swim. I can teach my kids how to swim, but my kid doesn't listen to me when it comes to certain things like this, like swimming. Mm-hmm. So that he's like, that's why I'm here. Because he's like, when you're a parent, you're going to realize there's certain things that you can do and certain things you can't do because you're either mom or dad. As the years went on, I started to realize like, okay, yeah, he's, you know, he's right because that's so true. A coach can push a kid more than a parent can 
push a kid because it's just mom or dad. The importance of a coach is there to push people, help people get to the next level, parents there to protect, provide, uh, nurture, developmentally, all that stuff, right? Not saying a parent can't teach life skills, but having someone else come in and give their two cents, their wisdom is a different perspective for the child because mm. similar to what we talked about early on, their environment was their home for two years. So they know mom and dad, they know the routine, they know the expectations, the standards, but when they go see someone else, now they're getting new standards, new expectations, and that helps them elevate, helps them grow the building blocks of life, basically, or the building blocks of development. They're slowly getting more and more and more, and that's making them stronger. So that leads us into parenting. Is there a way that a parent can continue to build their children without having an outside person come in. This is what I, I encourage my parents to do. First of all, turn off your phone, okay? Turn your phone off. When your child is talking to you, listen, mm -hmm. okay? Especially like the middle school teenage years because they don't want to talk to you in the first place. You, you're the most uncool person they've ever seen in their life, yeah. okay? So when they do come to talk to you, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So when they do come to talk to you, turn off your phone, okay? That's one. Two, when your child comes in from school, instead of asking them, just asking them how their day was and accepting good, because that's what they're going to tell you. And you're going to think it's good because, OK, on their report card, they said they got A's and B's. So, OK, their day was good. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, they're struggling so bad social emotionally that they're crying out for help, but they don't know how to do it with the parent. So as a parent, you go, OK, tell me one good thing that happened today. OK. And the kid says, oh, well, you know, I was on the. I played basketball today and I hit the shot, whatever, because that's how kids are. They're going to talk about that stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And then one thing that is a grow, what happened? Oh, oh well, I can't stand my teacher. Okay. So what happened with your teacher? Oh, I just can't stand and walk away. But what you did was you opened the lines of communication, right? Now, you know, in your head, there is a teacher that your child feels a certain way about. Then you ask that same question the next day. Hey, would you, oh, you know, we were, we were playing ball outside during recess and they made a move and then we got in a little argument, but we talked it out. Oh, okay, so now your child is showing you that they have some type of resolution skills, right? They can work through a problem and issue, right? Then it's a, what's the growth? Oh, that teacher's still annoying. I can't stand math. Ah, now you know it's the math teacher they're having a hard problem with. Okay, so what's going on in math? Oh, well, I can't get the concept and the teacher doesn't have time for me. So, but now because you're asking that question, and you're not judging them. All you're doing is listening. You're opening that line of communication. And the more you talk to your child, the more information they are giving you without them re even realizing it. Right. Mm -hmm. So then now, you know, OK, my child is struggling in math. OK, so how now you say, OK, so how can I help you in math? Do you want me to reach out to the teacher? What is it in math? Is it that they're not listening to you or they're not listening to you when you feel like it? Is it that you're up walking around in the classroom? Right. So you start to ask, start to pull information on a daily till you get like the whole full scope of the story. Mm -hmm. Then if you need to, you reach out to the teacher or if you can help your child in a moment, you can do that. But you must ask the questions to open the lines up mm -hmm. and it may start slow. Listen, the kid every day for two weeks may say it was good. Nothing. I had nothing. But if you constantly open the lines of communication, that one moment where they want to be vulnerable, they will share. Mm -hmm. because they know you're willing to listen if you're asking the questions. See, if you never ask the questions, then they don't know that you're going to listen. That's just mm -hmm. how their brain works. Also, something that's very important for parents to understand, at this age, you're going to get attitude, <laughs> okay? You're going to get attitude mm -hmm. because biologically, their emotions are at a higher level than their logic circuits. Mm -hmm. So anytime they respond, emotionally and it seems like it's not a big deal and they blow up is because their logic has not caught up with their emotions so if you give them that time to blow up and then once they start to settle down it kind of in lines with their logic so then when you start to talk to them then their logic circuits kick in and they're like oh okay and then everything starts to make sense but if you try to argue with them while their emotions are up then you're giving them a reason to be mad mm -hmm. then the focus is not what happened the focus is on you and now they're distracting from what's really bothering them. Mm -hmm. So you're actually hurting them in those moments when you're yelling, well, you better respect me. You better stop talking to me like this. Yes, they should respect you. Mm -hmm. But this is not the time to talk to them because right. they're not they're not hearing you at all. You got to wait for them to simmer down a little mm -hmm. bit. 
then you go talk to them. And of course, reinforce that you, they shouldn't be yelling at you. There is a level of respect. But in that moment, you cannot do that because the whole moment is lost. Right. You know, the whole moment is lost. So that and also, listen, listen, man, do a TikTok dance or something with your kids. Make a fool out of yourself. It <laughs> yeah. goes a long way. You know, you, you do a TikTok dance with them. They're going to look at you crazy. But then also you start to you start to find that they're sitting next to you with their phone. Mm-hmm. And then because you're next to them with their phone, they're scrolling through stuff and you're looking to see because TikTok has the algorithm. They're just going to show the videos that your child is constantly watching. Right. So now as they're flipping, you're like, oh, so my child is into that. My child is into that music. My mm-hmm. child is into that person. So you're getting another view of your child that you wouldn't necessarily see because, you know, they're hi- hiding in the corner in their room somewhere on their phone, mm-hmm. just giggling. So then now you're learning another thing about mm-hmm. your child. So, you know, sometimes making a fool of yourself in front of your child and opening up is another way to ingratiate yourselves to them. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and yeah. And also one last thing is talk about your talk. Let them talk to you about their goals. OK. And don't and don't shatter their dream. OK. Mm-hmm. If they say, oh, I want to be an artist and I want to be a musician. So, OK. How can we how can we facilitate that? You know, I, I told everybody I was going to be a lawyer and be in the NBA. Now, I, I just said lawyers, so they leave me alone. But I really wanted to be an NBA because, you know, I love basketball. Mm-hmm. Now, as an adult, I'm 5'11", 220 pounds. I wasn't going to be in the NBA. Mm-hmm. But my mom saw that I was passionate about it. And as an adult, she says, the reason I never killed your dreams because I knew you would do something with it. Mm-hmm. So she said, I knew you wasn't going to be in an NBA, but I knew you would do something with it. So it led me to college. It led me to get scholarships. It led me to teaching. It led me to coaching, right? But now... And now I'm teaching life skills through it. So I did something with it because I was passionate about it. So it's not always necessarily making it big in the market, but Mm -hmm. finding ways to use your skills in order to, you know, become a passionate adult into something. So don't kill you. Don't kill your kids dreams. Just listen to their goals and just see how you can facilitate it into real life. And that's, that's another big key I believe in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I went from being a lawyer to wanting to be business finance accounting and then eventually having the inclination to want to be a teacher. But I was like, teaching doesn't make any money. And then I was like, I don't know, because my mom's not going to like that. And then I was like, okay, let me let me do accounting. So that's what I started my career as doing business finance accounting. And then I was just dreading it every single day, just going into work, just miserable. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I can't do this. And so that's when I you know, started the journey to become a teacher. And I mean, it was so much more fulfilling. Mm-hmm. than just going and making ten, twenty thousand dollars more a year, you know, just starting off. Life is just not about the money. It's it's about finding your purpose, your passion, your gift, and then going mm-hmm. after it. And yeah, we can say we want to be something like a lawyer or a doctor to appease our parents, but are you appeasing yourself? Mm-hmm. Are you are you happy with yourself at the end of the day? Mm-hmm. Talk because, about it. Talk about it. Go on. Yeah. Because, because if people are not happy with themselves, that's going to push them down and they're not going to want to push in life. Mm. So they're going to say, you know what? I'm just not happy where I am, but I'm not going to do anything right. That's the comfort zone. So they stay there because it doesn't require fear. It doesn't require challenge. They can stay exactly where they are and they don't have to push past it. I always encourage people. The comfort zone is nice for now, but is it going to be nice later? right? Right. 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. So I always tell people to look forward because many people just look at right now. They look Mm -hmm. at what's going on right now. Then I even go back to middle school, high school. I wasn't necessarily worried about my future. I wasn't worried about who I was going to be when I was 65. I was worried about being the popular kid or being liked, right? The peer pressure, the peer acceptance was so powerful there or then that I said, I need to make sure that I'm liked, that I'm appreciated. Is that still something that people gravitate toward even after the pandemic? Oh, they gravitate, they gravitate to that even more, Mm. Um, you know, because now it's, we're in this space and I noticed that all the online clicks are hanging out now Mm. and I didn't have an online click. So how can I fit in here? Because, you know, some parents, the thing with the screen time, right? Some parents allowed unlimited screen time and it was others that, okay, you only got two, two hours of screen time. So instead of the face-to-face conversation that you would get on the yard, everything was on Discord. Everything was on Snapchat. Everything was on TikTok. So mm-hmm. if you're a person or you come from a family that didn't allow that, you missed out on a lot. Mm-hmm. A lot of the, you know, 
the inside jokes, the yeah. uh, the memes, the you know the mini discussions, the drama, the whatever. Right, you missed out on a lot. So then when you come face to face, you're trying to play catch up. So what do you do? When you try to ingratiate yourself into the space, you are over the top because you want to be seen. Mm -hmm. And then they're looking at you like, why are you being so over the top, right? It's like, well, I, I just want to be seen, right? What, what do you do when, with, uh, in middle school, right? When you like the girl, you didn't go over to say hi. You took that hat and ran, <laughs> right? You know what yep, I'm saying? So exactly. it was something over the top. You're like, why, why are you doing that? But it's yeah. just the, at, that, at this age, it's just natural to just do something over the top just to get attention. So it's even, like I said, it's even more so now where, you know, the kids are just finding difficulties, finding their space, and it's just going to take time. It's going to take repetition. Mm -hmm. So now it's the the face-to-face -face conversations plus the online stuff that right. they're catching up on. And, and, it, and it's tough. You know, I, I see kids here who are struggling to just to find friend groups, like they're bouncing. Mm. They're bouncing back and forth. And some of it is that, you know, I'm going to be honest, some of it, the kids are like, I don't want to deal with the drama, which I totally get. But the other kids, it's just like, how do I, they don't know how to fit in. Mm -hmm. Right. How, how do I fit it in this space? Because I kind of like what they're talking about, but not really. And then they bounce around. Like I was a kid. I was in multiple groups. I was, you know, I was on the basketball team. Mm -hmm. I did acting. I played violin and cello and orchestra. I was all over the place. I just, you know, I was all over the place. So I had multiple friend groups. I mean, at the time I felt crazy, but as an adult, it was like, okay, so what I did was I just, you know, what was going on at the moment, that's where I went. Mm -hmm. But not everybody's like that. They just want to fit in one singular space and have that comfort so uh there you know it's, it's a struggle but that's another thing that we have to you know the social emotional continue to address all the time mm -hmm. we have to do you think it's the responsibility of parents to make sure their children are going out and being a part of multiple groups so for example mom or dad should put them on a baseball team soccer team sports team should put them in some type of arts whether it's theater music uh, if they want to get extra education, so putting them in summer camps, uh, it could be whether educational or craft. So I there's think, multiple ways that they can give them multiple groups. Right. Yes. Yes and no. And I'm going to tell you this because a lot of that stuff is expensive. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to sit up here and tell parents, you got to go put your kid in two soccer teams and the lacrosse team. All that sports are expensive. Mm -hmm. All those programs are expensive. What I will say is they do offer free programs. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you need to do a little research and find the free programs in your space. And, you know, it goes back to listening to your child. If your child is into art, you put them in an art and a sport. If they're into music, you put them in a music and an art or music and a sport. Don't do them a disservice by just putting them in one thing. You want to expose them as to many, as many things as possible. Mm -hmm. But do make it a point to put it, them into something that they, they do like, because mm -hmm. if you don't, they're going to despise you and something that they may be good at softball, basketball, whatever it is, they may not take an interest in because they really don't want to be there in the first place. Mm -hmm. Right. But if they know, all right, on Saturday, I have basketball practice, but right after basketball practice, I get to go to the art studio and draw. So I'm going to do what I need to do with basketball practice so I can go to the art studio, because if I act up in basketball practice, they're not going to let me go to the arts. You see what I'm saying? So, right, yeah. but meanwhile, they're developing other skills, mm -hmm. other life skills. They're learning how to communicate. They're learning how to work with other people. They're learning how to listen. Like they're still learning all those things. Right. So then mm -hmm. as they get older, they may still take a liking to softball or soccer right. or whatever it is, but then can still do art or because you gave them that opportunity, they go, okay, I know I don't like this, but I really like art. Right. I know I don't like this, but I really like music. Mm -hmm. And then they start to dig in a little bit more, right? They start to want to find out more information. They start to create a portfolio. So sometimes you put them in things to really figure out if they don't like it. Right. You know, I've got, I've got kids here who, you know, I tried basketball with them. I've tried, uh, you know, introducing them to music, talking to the art teacher and all those other things. And all of a sudden I introduced them to something, uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And then they're like, oh, I like that. And then that's all they do. <laughs> Like one of them is yeah. like this like crazy blue belt because they found their passion in that. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's because I introduced them and gave them the opportunities. I just say, well, this is what this is. That's all that exists in the world. And that's it. So just just expose exposure is important. Mm -hmm. uh, you try to give them as, as much exposure as possible without without breaking the bank, without breaking your wallet. But yeah, it's important to expose. Them. Yeah, it's a concept of having multiple groups similar or go into the conversation of it takes a village to raise a child 
Yes, absolutely. So, um, as I said earlier, we, you know, t- as a teacher, I'm with your child eight hours of the day. As a parent, you have your child while awake, maybe five hours. Mm-hmm. Okay. But if we're not aligned in our ideals and our perspectives about your child, your five hours will completely erase mm-hmm. my eight hours of work because the child is going to lean on what they see from their parents. So what I say during school is not going to mean much if what is going on at home, you know, is completely different from what I'm saying. It's going to mm-hmm. undo it. OK, so that's why it's important that parents and teachers communicate. And it's important that the child sees the parents and the teachers communicate. Mm-hmm. You know, I encourage you to if you can go into the school and bring your child with them just to say hi, like a little like, you know, conversation in the morning. Hey, how you doing? Dropping off Johnny in the morning. And then the kid sees the pa- the parent and the teacher having a conversation. They know, okay, there's a united front here, mm-hmm. right? And I can rely on those people to give me the same message. Mm-hmm. Some kids may some kids may not like that. It stresses them out, mm-hmm. you know. But you know, but over time, you know, they start to realize and accept that you know there's two people they can lean on now. Right. Now, the other part of the village that people don't know about is you're out in the parks, right? And the people lining up against the gate, you know, just talking, have a conversation. They're part of the village. What kind of conversations are they having? What is your child hearing while they're outside of the park? And then all of a sudden your kid comes home and they're saying all types of different colorful language, curse words. It's like, mm-hmm. where did you hear that? Because we don't talk about that in the house. But it's like, oh, but when they're in the park, that's all they hear. So they believe that in that space, that's when they're allowed to speak, speak like that. But then it's up to you as a parent, right, to say, well, technically not supposed to speak like that. But in that space, they, that's how they may speak. But you cannot bring that home. Or you cannot bring that in school. Mm-hmm. You know, understand what I'm saying? So then now, what? Life lesson. Code switching. Mm-hmm. Right? What's appropriate and what's not appropriate in certain areas. Okay? The person at the deli that you see every day, that's somebody that's part of your village. Right? Interaction, exchanging money, making sure I got the right amount of money, making sure the food is correct. Learning how to speak up for yourself if the order is not correct. Right? That's part of your village. Going down to your local YMCA, the swimming coach, the volleyball coach in the area. That's part of your village. Okay. Aunties and uncles, everybody has a hand in raising the child. The person that walks by, you know, every day you see in the morning, just say good morning, the crossing guard, right? A part of the village. Because now I know when I see people, I must speak. I must say good morning, right? Because that's something that the child hears every day from the crossing guard or the people they walk by every day. They just make sure they say good morning, something pleasant, right? Yep. How do you feel when you walk by somebody and they say, oh, good morning, right? You feel that you're having a rough day or you think you're about to have a rough day, but that good morning kind of like sets you like, okay, somebody acknowledge me in mm-hmm. my space and they're hoping that my day is better. My morning is good. So that just brightens you up a little bit. That gives you like that extra time or that extra hour you needed to get past the day just because mm-hmm. somebody acknowledged you. So imagine if everybody in the village did that, right? We, we communicated in that way. And also, I'm going to be honest with you, another part of the village is the people who are not necessarily doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. But know that you don't belong in that space. You know, when I was growing up, I had a guy who, you know, I'd be at the park hanging out and I want to go wander and see what everybody else is doing in the corner. And one of the guys was like, no, 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 son. You don't belong over here. Go back over to the basketball court. Mm-hmm. Right. Look, they over there, they're selling drugs. They doing whatever it is they're doing over there. But, you know, he, he took it upon himself. It's like, no, you don't belong over here. Go over there. You mm-hmm. play basketball every day over there. Go play your basketball. You don't belong over here. This space is not for you. So you need those types of people, too, who they're not necessarily doing the right thing, but they're all part of the village because they know who belongs where and who has more to offer in the space and society. And it's like, this is not this is not for you. So mm-hmm. you actually need those people as well. So I, I commend those people who are not necessarily getting out of their own way mm-hmm. <laughs> because they yeah. need to, but do recognize that. You know, there are children that don't belong in certain spaces like, yo, you need to get out of here. So right. th- those all th- we're all apart. We're all affected by the village. Man. It's very mm-hmm. important. Mm-hmm. Do you think that type of negativity where if they see someone on the corner doing something, they want to be a part of it because they're not supposed to be there? So it's kind of like that forbidden fruit. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Oh, my parents told me not to do this. I want to go see why. Mm-hmm. Right. You ignite curiosity that way. And. They, they want to go try new things and they want to try dangerous things. They want to, children always want to see what they can get away with. Mm-hmm. Right. 
And that's why it's important that we stay on top of them. That's why it's important we have these conversations. And you're going to repeat, parents, you're going to repeat yourself over and over again at nauseam, and you're going to get upset. But it still needs to happen because you, when your child starts to walk in that direction and they feel that energy, you teach them to, if you feel in a funny way, if your energy changes and it doesn't feel right, then it's not right. Mm -hmm. Don't go over there exploring and see why it's not right. If you don't feel right doing certain things, then you need to remove yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just the lessons that they're hearing in the back of their head over and over again. They may not acknowledge it. They may not want to acknowledge it, but it's they, they have that feeling like, okay, this this may be what they're talking about, so I'm not going to go over there. But they, you know, it's, it's the tendency to gravitate to things, try something new. Like vaping is a big thing now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because it's not, technically it's not, you know, marijuana, but, you know, I still look cool smoking and you can easily, it's readily accessible, which is crazy to me. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, that's the big thing now. Uh, and they try to do it in secret, not knowing the smell of violets and whatnot in the air. <laughs> you just told yeah. on yourself smelling like lilacs, but, yeah. um, <laughs> just, um, but just encouraging them like, listen, okay, you tried it. It's not for you. Please don't. And show them over time what happens. Cause I mm -hmm. like, as a, as a person, I can't sit up here and tell a kid not to do something that I did. Mm -hmm. That's not fair. I could tell them why they shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to go out of my way and say, Oh, well I was doing, it. I'm not going to go and tell them my life story about it, but I can't sit up here and expect them not to go try it because I did it. My parents mm -hmm. not to, told me not to go do it. And I went and did it. Right. But it's giving, creating the conversation It's creating the stories. It's giving them the space to receive the information. It's like, okay, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Mm -hmm. I had a, I had a former student I was talking to on the, uh, he FaceTimed me. And uh, he's up in college now. And he's like, yeah, you know, I'm the designated driver because, you know, I don't want my mom to kill me, you know, because <laughs> mm -hmm. if she hears I'm drinking. Mm -hmm. Like, he's of age to drink, you know, but he's like, ah, you know, you in college. You know, in college, I, I mean, I was, like, you know, you ain't supposed to be drinking. I'm in college having a good time. You know what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was like, no, 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 no. I don't want to. I'm not going to do that, you know, because my mom would kill me. But that's because the lesson was in his head all the time, mm -hmm. right? He hearing it all the time. He heard the stories. He hears what's happening. He's seen all the uh, negativity that can happen from this. He's like, I'm just a designated driver, which mm -hmm. is great. But that wouldn't have happened if his mother didn't instill influence that in him, that, yeah. influence that over time. So it's very important. Our, our reach, teachers and parents, the village, our reach is so important to these students. Like They, they will eventually get it. It just takes time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the phases, right? They're mm -hmm. going to go through a phase. Whether it's the drinking phase, the hanging out with the wrong crowd phase, mm -hmm. it's a phase. And then you have to understand that that is going to eventually phase out. Now, sometimes people do keep in a phase longer than they should, right? right. And then that's where bad things can happen, hanging around the wrong people at the wrong time. And that could dramatically affect your whole entire life, whether it be now you're 21, you're an adult, and you're just hanging around the wrong people, doing the wrong things. Now you have a felony. And mm -hmm. yeah, and that can screw your whole entire life up there's people who just make mistakes and their whole life is is ruined just because of a mistake right and it's because they were young naive and they were curious because at the same time we just can't say don't do something if we did it but at the same time we have that knowledge we have that wisdom where we want to instill that upon them so they can make the best choice for them for their future so just being their support system being there to monitor, guide is going to be more important than being defiant and a uh, tyrant basically in their life saying, this is what you have to do. There's no other ultimatum. If you don't like it, get out, right? So we're basically giving them an option to experience life because they're experiencing life for the first time, right? Everything they do is the first time. Yeah, we, we have experience, we have wisdom, we have knowledge, but it doesn't constitute that they're new to this world and that they're learning everything for the first time. They're 15 for the first time, 16 driving for the first time, mm -hmm. and they have to go through those experiences, those challenges. So that leads me to how can parents unite, right? How can parents team up with other coaches, team up with other parents to voice their concerns? Is there something they can do, whether it be like emailing, writing uh, their superintendents? Like what can parents do? Well, so parents, you have a lot of power, okay? Um, I and I want you to know that. I want you to hear that. You have a lot of power. Your PTA, wherever you are, you have to find a way to 
get access to that. The beautiful thing about the the pandemic now is that a lot of these uh, PTA meetings are through Zoom. So even if you miss the live uh, feed, you can always watch it or listen to it on YouTube or something like that. So, mm-hmm. you know, most parents will say, oh, I don't have time. And I get that. I understand that. But if you could sit there and listen to the music or you could sit there for 15, 20 minutes to watch the TikToks or whatever it is, mm-hmm. you can put the YouTube video on in your earphones while you're washing the dishes. Mm-hmm. Okay. And just listen to where your tax money is going. Who's involved? Is your child actually getting the money that they say that they have? You know, one thing I will say is that know who's on your PTA. If you cannot be on the PTA, know who's on your PTA. Know the person who's up close and personal with the principal because they generally know all the information of where your funds are going, what activities are are happening, what programs are available, things like that. That is something that I that I encourage. I also encourage that when you when they have like socials or stuff at the school, go. Mm-hmm. Show your face. Bring some brownies. Bring some cookies. You don't have to bake them. Go to Costco's or BJ's. They got some nice, uh, you know, say it, nice, nice platters, platters yeah. a, nice platters. Just walk in and just talk to people because they listen. Let me tell you something. If you're a parent that nobody's ever seen before, them other parents are going to come to you because they're going to want to know who you are, which child you're attached to, and they're going to share the business because they're going to want to know your business. Mm-hmm. I mean, the unfortunate side effect of the PTA, right? But they're going to want to know your business, so they're going to share a little business. In the process of sharing their business, you're going to know who's the head, where the money's going, how they fundraise, are the programs happening like they say they are. You know, that, that, that is so important. So know your power. Get access to the budget. If you can't get to the PTA, know somebody in the PTA who's going to share this information and help you. Attend parent-teacher conferences if you can. You know, or email your teacher uh, email the teachers once a week. Hey, how is Susan doing? You know, great. They're doing good. Great. Okay. They're not. Okay. How can we fix it? Mm-hmm. What can we do? So I, I think those are very big ways that just, just make yourself available, mm-hmm. you know, and, in in certain ways, if they got socials, dances, fundraisers, you know, show up on a Saturday for an hour with your kids, even if he's just standing there watching just to be observant. But mm-hmm. you you know who the players are when they start bouncing around, shaking hands. You know who the players are, uh, you know, who's big. So just just do that. It goes mm-hmm. a long way. Offline, you and I were talking something about an email brigade uh, where where parents can, I guess, uh, voice their stories about whether it be their children, their concerns. Can we elaborate yeah. a little bit on that? Yeah. So I'm a, whew, okay. So I call this the parent email brigade, okay? and now, how this may come off is that I'm going to always tell you to advocate for your child. It's so important to advocate for your child, okay? But, and this is from the teacher, but, okay, please take the time to hear the whole story before you respond. I cannot tell you how many times parents have emailed or called uh, for their child and feel that their child has been put to the back burner, disrespected, disregarded. And then once they get the full scope of the story, then they have to back off a little bit because your child is not going to come home and tell you everything. They're just going to tell you their portion of what happened and how they felt about it. Okay, so please do your due diligence and don't just start emailing things away. And what also happens tends to happen is when parents start to email things away, they're responding with their own trauma. They're responding with what's going on in their lives currently. They're responding with. You know, what happened with them in middle school and high school? And they don't want the same thing to happen to their child. So they have this mama bear, papa bear mentality um, when writing these emails and not getting the full scope because they just want it to go away. So now because you just emailed and made it go away. Now the child has not dealt with the situation. You have not dealt with the situation. All the child knows now is if anything happens, regardless of what happens, my parents going to email and make it go away. You understand what I'm saying? So please do your due diligence. Check in with the teacher, you know, put the information together and then, you know, make your assessment. See how you can help the child. See how the teachers can help the child. That's I talked about that before, working together with your teachers to better serve your students. Quick story connected to that. So perfect example is child A went home and said that the whole grade is picking on them. Right. The whole grade is picking on them. Don't understand why they're getting bullied. They're tired of it because children now know like the exact language to get their parents worked up and rowdy. 
you know, mm-hmm. I'm getting bullied at school. Nobody talks to me. The teachers don't listen to me and all, you know. And so, of course, the parents come in on high alert. You're allowing my child to get bullied. These children are saying these mean things to them. I don't understand where this is coming from. It's like, okay, let's all sit down. So we all, we call the, we call the other children in. And the children go, yes, we have said these things. We have done, th- done these things. You know why? Because your child said this, 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 and this, and this, and start rattling off. So then the parents, instead of listening to that, the parents are like, my child would never say that. I raised my child to be better than that. You guys don't know what you're talking about. And, you know, you know, being typical mama and papa bear, right? Yeah. Then the phone comes out. And then the screenshots come out <laughs> <laughs> yeah. of all the things that their child has said, premeditated, mm-hmm. without any, you know, all the things the child has said. So the mom is changing different colors of red you've never seen before. Mm-hmm. The father starts fixing his hat 16, 17, 18 times. Mm-hmm. And if the child could put their head any lower, they'd be on the floor. Yeah. Right. Because now they're embarrassed. Mm-hmm. Right. So in that moment, right, we figured out. The child is not being honest, right? The parents came in, didn't do their due diligence. And, you know, it became this whole big unnecessary blow up mm-hmm. that didn't have to happen. If you just came in and say, look, what's going on? My child's saying they feel this way with these students. How can we fix this? What's going on? Mm-hmm. And as and for children, what I encourage them, I tell them, listen, be honest with your parents. Tell them the whole story. Parents are going to come and back you up. Parents will parents will show up and back their children up. Mm-hmm. Okay, But don't have them coming in there with half the information. Because right. not only do they get embarrassed, and then you're embarrassed as well. Mm-hmm. Because now you lied and, you know, your word doesn't mean that much yeah, trust to the parent. Broken. The trust is broken. Right? And now the parents are all stressed out because they now they got to retract some of their crazy mm-hmm. trying to back you up. Now that you put them in a, in a, in a uh, uncomfortable spot. And I've seen that, you know, I use that story because I was in the forefront of my mind, but I've seen it happen too often. So please, parents, don't just, you know, email, try to email stuff away and you know, try to get the full scope of the story. Even if you don't like the response that the teacher has, you know, let's just, please just take your time, take a deep breath, work together. We are here for, in service of your children. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, please. So that's 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 what that was about. All right, perfect. Yeah, that definitely from teaching to coaching to parenting, all valuable information, great insight. And is there any final words you want to say or also share how people can find you, of course, if they want yeah. to get a hold of you? All right, awesome. Well, first of all, thank you again for allowing me in your space. Of course. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I'd love to work with you again because I love your insight. And <laughs> I just want to say that out loud. Thank you. So what I, what I, I have the, if anybody could see in the back, I have passion and grit, something mm-hmm. I believe in. I believe in the strength of the village. Any and everything you do, you do with passion and grit, find your passion and get to it. You know, that's what I tell my kids. That's the mantra I live by. And it, it takes all of us to raise our children, especially after the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And we have to get past our own trauma. I think helping our children would help us with our trauma a little bit as well, because as adults, some of us still struggle with our trauma. I mean, I struggle with my, you know, my weight gains up and down. You know, mm-hmm. I was the fat kid in school. Yeah. You know, sometimes that sits with me, but I can't put that on my children. I right. can't put that on the children I teach because that's not them. So make sure you're working to better your children. Make sure you're be- working to better yourselves. I think we'll, and then we'll all be uh, better off for it. Mm-hmm. If you want to find me, I, I have a, I run a podcast. It's called, Hey, What Did I Miss? Uh, it's on Apple Podcasts, YouTube. You can find it on acoachcam.com. That's A-Y-E, coachcam.com. Uh, we just did a women empowerment series run by the students. The students came up with the questions, and my job was to find the guests. And luckily, I have fabulous guests come on, so please come on and check that out. Also, I have the parent guide of all the new slang that these kids are using. So if you want to go Ooh, check that out as well, important. I got yeah, I got the parent guide up there. So please go check that out. Leave a little note. If I missed any, the kids loved it. Well, some of them, some of them were mad because I gave up the secrets, but you know, <laughs> uh, they'll, get but over they, it. <laughs> they'll get over it. And uh, so, yeah, please go find me on a coach cam.com, a Y E coach and I appreciate your time and I appreciate your efforts. Let's all, all right. work together in this village. Thank you so much. Cameron Johnson, everyone. All right. Appreciate it.
All right. Thank you everyone for watching the interview with Cameron Johnson and myself. Wonderful information from teaching, coaching to parenting, all essential things that we need to understand. And even if you're not a parent yet, even if you're not a coach yet, even if you have never been a teacher, understanding these tools you can utilize in the people around you in your environment. The things that I teach you here on coaching and session is not just things that are going to be an occasional thing. These are things that you can incorporate in your life today. Of course, I encourage everyone to reach out to Cameron Johnson. His information is in the description box below. And of course, if you're looking to work with me, head over to RevanConcepts.com and we can get you some coaching and help you need. I will see everyone on the next episode of Coaching and Session. Until then, everyone take care.